All right. Um, in terms of your case studies, and most of you submitted a proposal. Those of you who didn't, um, I just have nothing but contempt for you. There, we can move on. Um, what I want you to do, if you look at module three, and, and I don't know how many of you have the uh, Moodle page in front of you right now. If not, take a look at it after class. Um, you know, I'm, I'm giving you some ideas of things to think about when you're looking at decolonization. Some of them are not mentioned specifically in the assigned readings. Some of them are mentioned peripherally in the assigned you readings. You can go get yourself some. Here, in your hey, Paul, kill your mic. Oh, sorry. That's all right, man. Um, no, we all have to run our households, man. That's cool. It's just that, you know, no need to share. All right, so uh, for example, um, every one of you who's dealing with a case of decolonization, and you, are all, you aren't all doing it, but most of you are dealing with a case of decolonization after the Second World War. One of the things, and the literature is going to help you on this, is try and explain, it, was there something about that period of time at the end of the Second World War that in the specific case I'm looking at, created certain opportunities for an anti-colonial struggle to succeed, okay? And then, you know, take in mind that notion of, of relative deprivation that we talked about. Um, Tedger's book uh, is, is sort of out there and available. I wouldn't recommend you get the whole book. It's very dry and nothing against Gur or anything else. It's just, it's a very dry, abstract theoretical book. But the theories are interesting and they might help you. Okay. And here's why. If you skip down on the page, you'll see a thing there where I say, oh, I'm being silly. I was being silly. I thought I took that out, but I didn't. Um, educated, ambitious, and radical. Oh, my. You know, a little homage to um, um, Wizard of Oz. I'm talking about leadership. One of the things that I found um, in the late stages of my undergraduate career was that it was much more interesting for me not to look at the withdrawal of the imperial power and the decision making there. That is interesting, okay? But to look at the emergence of leadership, of a cohort of leadership among the colonized, okay, that ultimately led to the creation of certain kinds of anti colonial organizations. Maybe there was an armed struggle. Uh, maybe there was a strong ideological component. There might have been a strong sense of ethnic nationalism. You know, th there was something. That, the, that this aspirational leadership among the colonized was using in order to mobilize people and sustain this anti-colonial struggle. And that's what I really, 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 really want you to look at. I don't care about the morality of anything, okay? It's not relevant. This is not a class in moral philosophy. If it were, we would look at those things. It's not that there is no value in that. There's no value here. What we're interested in is how did this happen? Why did it happen? And who and what made it happen? Okay. And so you'll notice that I, I put down there these, these three, what I refer to as biographies of relevance. What I'm trying to say is here's a kind of template of people who emerged as anti-colonial leaders. If you just simply Googled all three of them and looked at their Wikipedia entries, I guarantee you, you would start to see a theme emerging. You would see that all three of these people were, um, by the standards of their cohort, they were well-educated, even if they came from relatively modest background, they were well-educated. They often had a more cosmopolitan view of the world. Typically, they had spent time outside the colonial territory in the metropole. They might even have had a university education, professional training, something like that. Okay. Now, not every anti-colonial leader is like this. Okay. But if you look at Senghor, Nkrumah, and Ho Chi Minh, and as you know, that is not his name. Okay. That was one of the many names under which he, he traveled and, and worked as a radical activist. Okay. But you'll find that there are things thematically to look for. I don't want this to be, though, a character study. Okay. What I'm trying to suggest is that these are people who were aspirational, okay? They weren't willing to, to just take the status quo. They weren't willing to just accept whatever the colonial administration handed out to them. There was a point beyond which they decided that their, their expectations were far beyond what the colonial administration was offering them. Then the challenge becomes, first of all, to recognize whether or not that is a chronic 
condition among the colonized. And if it is to find ways to mobilize the colonized, to throw off the colonial administration, to look for those opportunities to do that successfully, to try to make the decision about whether or not that is going to require an armed struggle, to try to make the decision as to whether or not the best way to mobilize people is an appeal to you know, primordial ties, ethnic identi identity, uh, tribalism, whatever you want to call it. What is most likely to be effective and why? So it means you're going to have to have some insight into the pre-colonial environment as it existed at the time of the first sort of colonial occupation, right? And, and, and again, I don't expect necessarily that all of you are going to approach this the way, say, a scholar in political science would. Many of you are historians. You, you want to look at this as an historical narrative. You still have to answer the who, what, and why. You still, I mean, even if you're a journalist, you have to do that, okay? So that's okay. I don't care. I'm not looking for this and thinking, well, every one of these has to be a rigorously theoretical, you know, work of abstraction or something. Um, but there is value in modeling this as a problem, right? Or as a phenomenon to observe so that you can kind of in your mind, you know, turn the thing around and look at it and say, well, what's going on inside this thing? Why did this happen the way it happened? Who were these people who mobilized this thing? And, and on what basis and in what context? And where were the opportunities for them? Where did they recognize, ah, now this is the time to go. How do you know when it's time to strike? Okay. Generally speaking, again, you can use, if you choose, that concept of opportunity structures. There were things that might have either been built into the colonial administration or that might have emerged as that colonial administration became more and more stressed because of global depression. Not enough attention, by the way, often is paid to the impact on the colonial um, possessions of the global depression of the 1930s. You know, um, it places certain kinds of strains on, on the colony as well as the metropole, all right? And, and that might, that you might find that there was something in that. You might find that, um, that it was the war. You might find that, you know, it was something else. You know, you need to kind of help me understand that. Write this thing as though you're trying to explain it to a reasonably smart, more or less educated person who's never heard of this before, okay? Now, in terms of the, the modes of anti-colonial struggle, I've just given you some examples of things to think about. This is not intended to be comprehensive. In other words, I don't wanna to arrogate to myself this idea that, oh, let me just tell you how to do all this. Cause I don't know, your cases are gonna demand a certain kind of analysis. But if you look at the Moodle page, you'll see that I've listed a few things there. One of them is, was Marxism Leninism instrumental as a mobilizing uh, theory or ideology? for your particular case. Now, obviously, depending on, you know, what the case is. For example, if you're doing um, Ireland, Marxism, Leninism ain't gonna help you very much. It's just not, okay. But if you're doing, um, if you're doing Tanzania, it might, it might. If you're doing Angola, it absolutely will. Because Samora Michelle is a Marxist Leninist, right? You see what I'm saying? In other words, it may or may not be relevant to you. And then I, um, I mentioned armed struggle and the, the sort of uh, Kalashnikov revolutionaries. We, we were, when we were in, when we were, I guess, somewhere between being an undergraduate and going to graduate school, there was a cohort of people I was working with, most of whom were working on their PhDs. And we came up with, I think we were drinking beer and having fun. And, you know, we decided, I, so I think I blurted out this notion of, oh, we're, you know, we're writing about the Kalashnikov revolutionaries. And, it brought up this whole interesting discussion, which was pretty good for a bunch of people who were hammered about the extent to which armed struggle was inevitable and under what circumstances was it most likely to appear to be inevitable. Clearly again, using Angola as an example, all right? The anti-colonial struggle itself became increasingly violent. So you'd have to explain to me why. You'd also have to understand that as a consequence of that, in the immediate aftermath of formal independence, this civil war exploded, where you had the MPLA and UNITA, and you had the great powers, particularly the United States and the Soviet Union and their surrogates, intruding into this civil war, aggravating it, 
exacerbating the violence, arming these people. You had the Soviet Union sending, you know, Cuban military advisors in, just like we did in Vietnam, right? And using Angola as a kind of surrogate war, okay? Opposing UNITA, which was pro-United States and sort of center, center right, and probably in power would have moved farther to the right. It might have been an incipient fascist regime. We don't, I don't need you to speculate. I mean, you need to explain to me the things that you can determine on the basis of what you can verify, okay? Uh, so to what extent was violence important? Again, using the example of Ireland, extraordinarily violent. Most of that history, I would suggest to you, is extraordinarily, is, it's this sustained violence and, and the sustained notion of terrorism and everything else, okay? But not every anti-colonial struggle Concede, if you concede Ireland as an example of anti-colonialism, uh, not everyone was that relentlessly and persistently violent. Um, again, you might find that Tanzania kind of is kind of underwhelming um, in terms of violence when compared, say, with or, or Ghana um, when compared with, say, Algeria, you know, which was incredibly chronically violent. Okay. So those are the things that I want you to think about. The other one I mentioned is cultural or ethnic nationalism. Um, when these organizations were put together to, to um, coordinate and, and sustain the mobilization of anti-colonialism, how many of them made appeals to some sense of ethno-nationalism? The idea that, you know, in other words, exploiting the alterity that's inevitable to colonialism to make it a mobilizing force for the struggle against colonialism. Does that make sense? Okay, because it can be, and you'll see some of your cases, it just screams at you. It's like, wow. But if you look, for example, at Rwanda, okay, a lot of people wonder about that. It's like, why, why did we have this horrible, for want of a better term, genocide between the Hutu and the Tutsi. What was that? Well, there's an analysis that claims it's a direct legacy of the way in which the colonial administration worked and the way in which the colonial administration was ousted. Okay. Um, that again, that's for you to decide, but it's, it's almost always the case that these things don't happen in a vacuum. They don't just happen suddenly and in, in an unprecedented way that looked at properly with the right corrective lens of theory and historical background. You can begin to understand, oh, now you know what? I didn't know that before, but now that I know that, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. You, you start, I mean, it was funny. When I, still to this day, when I do research, a lot of times I feel like a, like a police officer investigating a crime scene. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to, to figure out what the hell happened here? And then you realize, well, I got some evidence here. I got some clues. And you start to reason back from those things that you know you can see and extrapolate outward from that. Well, let's see, um, uh, I know that there was a, um, there was a strong internal faction of different ethnic groups. You know, if you think about South Africa, for example, I mean, you think about uh, the Gosha and the Zulu, and there was, there were, you know, years and years and years and years and years and years and years of historical and cultural animosity, violent animosity between those two ethnic cohorts. So that reminds us that this wasn't just a black white struggle. Um, there was a, a rather um, insidious practice among in violent insurgents in South Africa at the time when the ANC was rising in power, um, a punishment called necklacing. Okay, does anybody know what necklacing was? You get a, um, you get like a car tire and you pour gasoline on it and in it, you stick it around somebody's neck and you light it. That's not something that the Afrikaner and the Anglo South Africans were doing to black South Africans. That's something they were doing to each other. Okay, that it was most common there. So there was a, a real hatred that was baked into South Africa. A lot of it was a legacy of that period of time um, really before the consolidation of the Republic of South Africa that's called the Mfakani where um, the Zulu, among others, were, were actually uh, a kind of aspirant to military empire in Southern Africa. And they were, they were just shattering these societies, destroying people, you know. Um, they, they, it's like you were watching the Nazis or something, you know. 
And, you know, the Kosha, among others, ethnically remember that history and remember what it did to them. So notwithstanding the presence of whites in South Africa, there was that tremendous animosity. I think we often make the mistake when we're looking at, say, Asian colonialism or uh, Sub-Saharan African colonialism, we look at it as, as just a, a racial issue between the, the white colonizer and the non-white colonized. For those of you particularly looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, that clearly is not enough. That's not nearly enough, okay? Because in every situation, the aftermath of independence could very easily explode into prolonged violence. And you're gonna, you find, again, you find it in Angola, you find it in Mozambique, you find it in Nigeria, you find it to some extent in Ghana. I mean, you have coup after coup after coup. You have, you know, um, young officers um, kicking out a civilian regime and you figure why? What was the key to that? Often it was ethnicity and that historical record of, you know, what those differences had been. Primordial ties matter. So be sure that you're thinking about that as well. Now, at that point, because I've been talking for quite a while, but I wanted to make sure that I introduced all those subjects. Does anybody, either in general or specific to your case, have any questions about the stuff that, that I was just talking about in terms of what I'm asking you to do? That kind of silence makes me nervous in this class. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna email you later about my case. I have I have like a plan for it. I'm actually ditching my original idea to do Panama just because I think that that's kind of a little off base and would be a lot of. A well, lot we of talked about that. That it might you know I told you that you might want to take an extra day to think about that. Yeah, so I think I, I think I have rethought that one over. I'll email you after class with okay. what I I've got a good plan. So. Okay. But I mean, we talked, when I was talking about people who hadn't yet, you know, satisfied the proposal thing, um, you were not among those because you and I had already spoken. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I already, I spoke with a couple of you and you still turned it in on time, but you're not so in you, trouble. So you, don't hate, you don't hate me, Bill? I don't hate you, Paul. I don't hate you. I don't like you, but I don't hate you. <laughs> well, I'm all right with that. There you go. Yeah. You know, we're not friends here. We're just colleagues. All right. Uh, so start thinking about that. Now, in terms of well, how do I go about doing this, okay, one of the things that I would do, okay, is take, you know, take your decolonization book and just, you know, just see if by any chance when you, when you look at this book and you pull it out, is your case or anything related to it or even your part of the world mentioned in the index, you know. Do the same thing, you know, with the chapters that I've assigned. Obviously, you don't have the index for those, but you know, as you're reading through there, just look for evidence that would invoke your case or one that you understand to be something like that. Because what the authors are trying to do, the way I'm using the literature here is give you an idea of kind of general models to try and explain the different ways in which colonial empires worked, which can in part explain the different ways in which the dismantling of colonialism occurred, okay? And so, I mean, obviously, yes, you can Google. Uh, one of the things a couple of you have done, which is a really good idea, is that you have gone to the World Factbook of the CIA, which is free and online and has a ton of data, and looked at the information there. To, you know, sometimes there's a little, uh, little blurb in terms of the history of these countries that will explain this is sort of how it became independent. There, there, there are going to be um, maybe names of organizations mentioned, names of individuals mentioned, periods of time that will help guide your research. And the World Factbook is a very, you know, a very reliable source of data, I would say. Generally, uh, pretty commonly used by scholars around the world, okay? So not, no data set is perfect, but it's really not that bad. Um, so that would be something I'd recommend that you do. Um, and then obviously, you know, just sort of go to the Hannon Library site um, and look, don't look for books. Okay, now this is being recorded. Don't look for books, look for articles. Okay, look for peer reviewed articles. Why am I asking you to do that? Why am I suggesting that you not look for books? There's method in my madness. You Material don't. can be too time consuming. That's right, first of all. A book can be overwhelming. 
They're too long. Yeah, Ryan says they're too long. For your purposes, yes, they are. If you were doing a dissertation or a master's thesis, by all means, you know, bury yourself in books, but you're not. But there are other reasons why articles can be much more useful for you, other than just the fact that there's not, there are not as many words on a page. Yeah, Cole. Is it the Wikipedia answer where, where there, there, those articles themselves will have, will have sources in them that may also serve, serve, serves you useful? It, it, that's right. Um, part of it, you know, Ryan brings up an interesting point, says books don't need to be peer reviewed. Um, if they come out of a university press, they functionally have been, but that's a great point because you might stumble on, and I, I did this all the time as an undergraduate, because you know, you got this big gaping area of, of error in your head that just wants to fill up. And you find this book about some subject matter and you think it's really great, not realizing the person writing this is full of shit, you know. Um, it's, but it's a good read and it gets stuck in your head and it takes a long time to disabuse yourself of those things. Articles have to be, if you check peer review, that means a bunch of people like me had to say, yeah, it's okay. As far as we know, this is about as accurate as you can get there. Or, I disagree with the perspective, but it's worth having out there. It contributes to the existing body of knowledge in this subject matter. They also tend to take a more focused, narrow slice of something. They allow you to go much deeper into something that you need to get background in, okay? Where a book can sometimes be either exhausting in its content, kind of like Ryan was suggesting, or so general that they just, they, they raise a lot of questions, they don't answer a lot of them though, okay? But articles are focused on some specific narrow aspect of what you're trying to look at. Just look at this thing, from this point of view, look at this thing, okay? Now, then as Cole suggested, look at the sources they cite. Because every one of those, um, every one of those articles is going to have a pretty extensive literature review. Okay, your next assignment now that I have you here, okay, is to begin to assemble a literature review. Okay, where you make little annotations of the articles you find, and and, and again, don't just summarize the article. Tell me specifically. Tell yourself specifically. In this article, this is useful for me. It answers this question or leads me to answers for this fundamental question that I'm trying to address in my own work, okay? It's a very good way to do that kind of research. You know, be guided by that thing of, okay, let me do the scholars do a little work first. Let me just, you know, I'm admitting my own ignorance. Um, let me just kind of dive in here and let the scholars do some of my work for me. Let them teach me but let me take notes on what they're teaching me the same as I would if I were in a lecture, right? And let me make a note that, for example, let's say you're doing, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of a case we haven't talked about and I'm not, going, all right, screw it. Let's say you're talking about decolonization of the Americas and you, you're, you're just, you know, you're doing the one thing Bill doesn't want you to do. You're using what became the United States as a case because you hate Bill and you think it's really funny to annoy him. And you think that's the cleverest and most darling thing in the world. Not realizing Bill's gonna absolutely shred you because the, one of the few things he hates more than reggae is that, you know? And, and you know, your head's gonna be somewhere on a stick. You know, that's cool if you want that. Let's use that as a case. And so you're saying, well, let's see. Um, what are the moving parts of this? Who was the colonizer? The colonizer was the British Empire but not exclusively because the Dutch had a piece of that. Um, the French had a piece of that. The Spanish had a piece of that, just in terms of the geographical area. You know what this tells me? Potential conflict between competing imperial powers. You see how I'm already trying to model in my head what I'm looking at. You should be able to do that. You know where this is really going to become apparent for you? The two areas that I find the most fascinating, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa where you have, you know, like, look at the Southeast Asian Peninsula, Indochina, okay? You have a number of large powers contesting to project force there. You have this historical legacy of nearly a millennium of China trying to intrude into um, what became Indochina, you know, Southeast Asia, right? So China matters. You have the French, you have the British because of Burma, and, and things like that. Everyone wants what was then called Siam, later Thailand, 
everyone wants a piece of that, okay? It never was really in the period of time we're talking about successfully colonized. That's important in itself because people were using these colonial territories. This is where Laos becomes very important. Why would anybody be interested in Laos? There's nothing there. Yes, there is. There's the Mekong River across which is Thailand, access to Thailand. You see, I'm making a model in my head. I could, I mean, I did that as an undergraduate by pulling out a physical map and looking at the map, okay? And it was like, shit. You know, I put myself in the frame of mind of a colonizer and I, and I thought, well, I knew enough about Thailand to know there were a lot of reasons why people wanted Thailand. Again, Siam. Um, so what do you do? Well, one of the things you can do is that river is a wonderful natural border. There's a floodplain there, so that means there's going to be arable land. Okay, well, that's kind of nice. And um, there are a lot of people there who are doing sort of subsistence agriculture and not much else in, in, La you know, in Laos. But it's a really nice buffer between Vietnam on one side and Thailand across the Mekong. All of a sudden, I started thinking, yeah, you know what? I would, I would maybe think about colonizing that. I would maybe think that that was desirable. So then I try to follow that path. You know, I go to the scholarship and talk about, uh, see, I put in search words like colony, Laos, Thailand, and see what comes up. Colony, Laos, Mekong Delta, Mekong River, okay? And just see what pops with those search words. D does what I'm saying make sense or is it like, nah, I'll, you lost me? I mean, you, you were talking about the United States and now you're talking about Southeast Asia. What I'm trying to suggest is, we started with the United States with an obvious example, historical example that we all know. Then I said, okay, let's take a little more rarefied example that you might not be so familiar with. Let's look at Southeast Asia. You can do the same thing. Maps are your friends. Rivers are your friends. Any source of water is your friend, okay? Because where there are water, there is water, there are people. Where there are people, there are other things. But also where there is water, there might be minerals. There might be all kinds of things. Where there are highlands, there could be arable land for things like tea and coffee. You, you got to start thinking like that. That's why I was trying to emphasize that, you know, economics were far more important than religion in the expansion of empires. Because you might be in a place where, yeah, you've got a pretty sophisticated uh, technology and everything else, but, you know, you're kind of the land on which you live is not maybe very extensive or maybe it doesn't have a lot of the natural you know, mineral deposits or oil or anything like that. Think of Japan. You got these islands, many of which are in really cold climates, okay? You've got very limited access to resources and yet you have this explosion of technology, especially in the 19th century, right? And so Japan's just kind of you know, hunkering down, ready to spring as this new empire. But in order to do that, they got to feed the industrial, you know, the industrial beast. Well, how are they going to do that? They need to get raw materials that they can't produce themselves on those islands. They need to get oil that they can't produce themselves. Okay. Where are they going to go? Well, maybe they're going to go to Mongolia or maybe they're going to go out into the Pacific, into those islands. Maybe the Dutch have something they want. Okay, all of a sudden you start thinking, oh, that's why they went there. Those clever people, right? I want you to start thinking like that and try to cultivate, you know, that sense of curiosity that leads to that sense of discovery, that leads to that sense of understanding that allows you to kick the crap out of this assignment, okay? So that you really find yourself totally immersed in it. Some of you have taken on what may very well be exceptions to the rule. I've talked with a couple of you already, okay? I would say be aware of that, but understand that there's nothing wrong with researching what may very well become an exception to the rule. That in itself is an important discovery, okay? If you wanted to do Afghanistan, for example, okay, the first thing you'd have to know about Afghanistan could be answered very easily, again, by looking at a map. Why should anyone care about that? When as soon as you, I mean, if you go into this other room, which is the only other room in my place, one entire wall is taken up with a map of the world that is that is surfaced so that I can draw lines on it with an erase, a dry erase marker. 
okay? I do it all the time. You know why? Because it, it helps me lock those pictures in my head. Afghanistan is one of those places, okay? If you think about, like if I was gonna do Afghanistan as a case, I would know right away, boy, I got a lot of work to do here. On the other hand, what a cool thing to take on because you get to do the whole history of the great game. You get to do the whole history of the, of the clash of the empires between Russia and Great Britain. It's a fascinating history. Part of it was fought out in the Crimean War. The rest of it was fought out around places like Afghanistan. How many of you have ever read Sherlock Holmes? Where did Watson get his war wound? Afghanistan. How many of you have seen the more recent BBC series, Sherlock? Where did Watson get his wound? Afghanistan. Okay, Afghanistan matters. It absolutely matters. But also, it's called the graveyard of empires for a reason. So see what I'm saying? In other words, what you're dealing with there, I would say, whether or not it fits the case of colony as we've been discussing it, what you might describe is, no, you know what? It's a colony in the sense of being a perennially contested territory. That might be the best way to look at it. Now, I'm not telling anyone how to do that, but I'm suggesting you're on to something with that. Roll with it, but just make sure it go in stages. Look at the map, make sure you get the geography, attach power relations to that geography. In other words, that's called sort of, you know, think about geopolitics. Uh, then Afghanistan becomes paramount in that part of the world, okay? Especially important when, after the demise of the British Empire, particularly in India, suddenly South Asia catches fire. Because Afghanistan's sitting right there. If you look at a map, like there's, they, 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 there's a tiny, tiny, tiny border they actually share technically with India but they definitely share a border with Pakistan. We know that part of the challenge for the United States and every empire that's gone in there has been what became Pakistan. There's even, there's a board game called Pax Pamir that's based on that, okay? That whole struggle. So you see, what you might come up with is a little bit of an exception to the rule. Don't be discouraged by that. Your task then becomes, okay, well, how do I explain this to the reader? Because it has some of the, it certainly has the territorial contestation that we associate with an expansion of empire. So there are empires muddling around there, but was it ever successfully colonized? If you put a surrogate government, a puppet government in place, is that the same as colonialism? Is it indirect rule? Is that what the United States was doing in South Vietnam when they, when they you know, first put Diem in power you know, by rigging an election and then allowed him or facilitated his assassination. Was that a kind of colonialism? That's up to you. As, but again, don't just guess. Really try to build your case as though it was something you had to prove in court. And if you do that, you're going to come up with some solid work. Okay? Now, so far, again, I, I'm talking a lot, but I'm trying to kind of light a fire under your asses here, for one thing, because this is something that if you leave it sit, it's going to be a lot of work. If you start right now, it's going to be a challenge, but it's going to be a manageable challenge. The worst thing you can do, though, is think, nah, I got this, and let it sit, because you'll go cold on it. Okay, any questions? All right. Now, one of the things... And I, I said that the, um, the other linked literature down here wasn't required. I don't mean for you not to read it. I mean, you don't have to. But the, the Janssen and Osterhammer, the Decolonization and Short History, they're trying to set you up for something that you might want to think about, okay? And what they're doing in here is among other things that they raise, a lot of that will sound familiar to you. If you, if you, to the extent that you've absorbed both, I would say, Reinhardt, Howe, and certainly Kennedy, you're not getting a lot of new information. That's okay, repetition teaches. But in addition to that, one of the things that these authors are trying to encourage you to do 
is simultaneously bring to bear two perspectives. One is the larger um, perspective of the empire or colonizer. You know, in other words, when, when people look at colonialism, especially you know, historically, when scholars look at colonialism or empire as phenomena, they looked at them from the point of view of the aspirational power, you know, commanding these territories and contesting with indigenous peoples for control of those territories and, you know, looking for the development gap and all those kinds of things. Okay. And that's fine. That's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. What I want you to think about, though, and it seems to me that this is an indispensable component of decolonization, you got to turn that lens around. And you've got to try and look at this from the point of view of those trying to oust or throw off colonialism. And that's why it's important to look at those things of, well, you know, who are the people and what were their aspirations who finally got this anti-colonial struggle moving? It wasn't, it wasn't as I think you're, you'll see when you look at the literature, it wasn't just that the colonial powers very benevolently decided, we've changed our minds. It's no longer moral for us to possess other people's territory. That clearly did not happen clearly. I mean, Kennedy is screaming that at you. Otherwise, why was it so violent? Even after the Second World War, right, for all of the talk about new values and self-determination and territorial integrity and all that nonsense, colonies persisted. The Brits fought as hard as they could till they couldn't sustain that struggle anymore. They were taking people who were doing national service and sending them to Burma and places like that. You know, just like guys off the street, you know, blokes, right? Oh, you're going to Burma. What for? <laughs> What's a Burma? You know, so you had, you know, the, the inability of the empire to maintain control in these contested territories. So then turn it around and look at it from the point of view of the colonizers, or the colonized who think, aha, we now have an opportunity to push. There's a, there's, a, there's a weakness here that maybe we either we didn't see it before or it wasn't there before and now it is. Okay, clearly that is the case with both the French and the British. Um, after Dien Bien Phu in 1954, it was pretty clear to the insurgents in Vietnam, you know, the Viet Minh, for example, um, we, we can in fact, through armed struggle, defeat a European power. It's just going to take us a while. I don't know that they were all banking on the immediate intervention of the United States as a surrogate for France, perhaps, but that's what happened. And they got they, they kicked us out anyway. Remember, we did not win in Vietnam. We didn't really accomplish much of anything in Vietnam. But, the, but North Vietnam did. North Vietnam fought for and got what it wanted. It unified Vietnam. South Vietnam never really wanted that. So part of, if you're doing Vietnam, for example, you know, looking at it from the point of view of the colonized, even there, you have an important fraction within Vietnam that North-South matters. North Vietnam had suffered the burden of the terrible famine as a consequence of the French and Japanese interventions uh, during and immediately after the Second World War. North Vietnam was largely responsible for, for holding out and defeating the French at Dien Bien Phu, not the South. The South was, was disproportionately Catholic. The North by then was increasingly Marxist-Leninist, meaning essentially atheist, okay? These distinctions matter and they explain why the Arvin forces would fight with the United States rather than making common cause with those with whom they share an ethnic identity in the North, because they saw the threat from the North as worse than anything the Americans were going to do. They also saw the Americans arming them, giving them equipment, giving them logistical support, and ultimately sending at its peak half a million boots on the sets of boots on the ground in, in a relatively small territory. Keep in mind with Vietnam, right? As far as we know, that's the last time where the American military put on the table the use of tactical nuclear weapons. You know, we were going to use tactical nukes, or at least the threat of tactical nukes, to defend Khe Sanh during the siege, which is interesting because within a month of that, we abandoned it and never thought about it again. That's how scary Southeast Asia was getting. 
Well, everybody within Southeast Asia knew that, okay? Because they were living through it every day. But it's, it wasn't this idea of Vietnam against the United States. There were tremendous fractions within Vietnam itself. So part of my obligation as a scholar is to remind the reader of that, maybe not do a complete comprehensive history of it, but I have to acknowledge it and I have to maybe provide some examples, all of which would be well so, uh, cited and supported by available literature, okay? So again, don't make an assertive statement of any kind that you can't support. This isn't about opinion. It's only about what you can say that is informed by your research, okay? Any questions there? Because that's where a lot of you in your first drafts are gonna hit the wall. You're gonna, either you're gonna forget that you didn't know this stuff and you're gonna think you've already known it, which is a common mistake. That's why it's a good idea to keep those annotated bibliographies because you can always wonder, where did I hear that? You look back through your annotated bibliography and maybe you've got, I don't know, 20 sources there or something like that. And maybe you got more. Um, and you think, oh, okay, I got my notes here. That's, that's right. Well, now I know who to cite. You know, And remember that when you're doing an annotated bibliography, if, if, if it's a, obviously if it's a book, um, have the complete bibliographic citation. But then when you talk about what in that source was useful to you, cite the pages, because then if you have to, you can go back and find them. If I were you and I had access to it, I would even copy those pages so that you've got them with you so you know what the page numbers are. Okay, if it's an article, same thing. Be able to cite author, date, page number, in addition to having a complete bibliographic citation. It's, it's not just a technical exercise. It's important to remember who influenced your writing. Whose shoulders are you standing on when you do this research? It's, it's ethical, among other things. It's part of the ethical use of data. Okay, now, are there any other questions about your assignment, because I only wanted to talk a little bit um, about Kennedy, primarily, um, I think, um, chapter two, and maybe get into chapter three a little bit. But um, I didn't want to talk about that too much today. I wanted really to spend more of our time on Thursday talking about that to give you more time to read. But OK, last chance, questions about your case studies. Okay. I, oops, John, did I see your hand go up? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, you may have mentioned before, but is there like a spe uh, spe specific format you want like us to no. follow like, how you want us to present it? No, as long you you work in a format that you're most comfortable with because it'll be easier for you. It'll be more intuitive for you. The main thing that I'm looking for in terms of the format you use is if I read what you've written, I should be able, just with reference to your text, I should be able to have enough information that I could, and by the way, I will check your sources and make sure that you're using them appropriately, okay? But there are any number, of, there are many rooms in the mansion. You, you choose the room that you're most comfortable in. Yeah, that's a good question, but I, I never, ever, ever, even when I teach, which I'm not gonna teach in another research methods class, I don't teach format, I teach research. Presentation, you probably learned in high school or, or maybe in USEM or something like that. And that's good. It can be useful. If you ever want to get published, it's very useful. But, um, but no, I'm not going to quibble about which format you use as long as I know, okay, this is, there, there's your citation. I know, you know, if you want to use footnotes, endnotes, parenthetic inserts with author date, whatever it is, and then always, always, no matter what you use, at the end, a complete alphabetical, complete list of references. Okay, right. Anything else like that, you know, technical stuff, anything like that. All right. I don't want to have a hard and fast deadline. If, if I see people lagging, I will impose that, but not until then. But I would say by this time next week, you should have a preliminary annotated bibliography assembled of a minimum, I would say, a minimum of 10 sources. By the time this thing's done, you're going to have somewhere probably between 20 and 50. Somewhere, depending on how, how obscure the case is and things like that. And again, as Cole pointed out, if you find one peer-reviewed article, you're going to have a minimum of an additional 20 sources there that they're using. 
Look at their literature review. They're trying to tell you, hey, if you want to know more about this, you can go here and here and here. Is there, um, is there some sort of controversy among scholars, some contestation of ideas? Well, I have to capture that in my literature review. They're telling you, when you do this research like this, be aware. There is this area where scholars don't yet have a consensus. Okay? And you might want to acknowledge that in your own literature review. If you cite something as a consequence of reading someone's literature review, but you're not able to go to the original source, okay, cite the original source as quoted in, and then cite the source in which the literature review guided you to that finding. In other words, you read a literature review um, by me, and it cites an article that was written by Graham Ramsey, okay, you can't get that article. So you, but you have the citation, right? So you, you cite it, you cite Ramsey as quoted in, as found in, and then you, you cite the article with page number of the literature review where that article was mentioned. Does that make sense? It, it, it's easier to do than it is to explain, okay? Because I understand you, you've got a very limited amount of time here, all right? This is week six. You're going to want to have a draft at least by week 10 so that you can use week 11 to revise it. Okay, because remember, there's no final in this class. So in what would be finals week, which is week 11, that's just going to be a, a regular week. And very likely what I will do is not hold class during week 11, but I'll be available all day for individual class meetings if you want to like send me a draft that you've done and then we can meet on Zoom and talk about it. So I don't want you to feel like I've just thrown you in the deep end and I'm going to go away and wait for the bubbles. Okay, you, um, you do the best you can. If you hit a wall on anything, the best way to deal with that is for you and I to have a talk the way we would if we were on campus and you stopped by my office. I, I'm happy to do that because this is, if you've never done this before, it's a lot of work. Okay, it's not that it's hard work, but it's a lot of work. And you need to manage your time and you need to, you know, you need to um, develop a little paper trail. Again, the use of an annotated bibliography can be real important. All right. Anything else about the assignments? All right. Then if we go to Kennedy, I know you're probably getting tired of this, but I happen to think it's a pretty damn good book. Um, when you go to chapter two, what is Kennedy, if you had to summarize this, so you were doing a book review of just chapter two, it was an article. Tell me in a sentence or so, what is Kennedy trying to teach us? What does he want us to know or understand that we might not understand or that we might overlook? Well, he talks a lot about the difficulties that like the European powers faced with losing their colonies and uh, how, how reluctant they were to give them up. Um, oh, and wait. Um, and in particularly, I liked what they were talking about the, the Dutch and the French instituting mandatory conscription in their colonies. I found that part particularly interesting to help combat the insurgencies that were happening in the early 50s. Um, I yeah. one, Bob. Okay, now that's an interesting point because there are a couple of things embedded in that. First of all, the idea of, um, you know, we've got this context, you know, if you look at chapter two, which is a global war. We already talked a little bit about World War I as a kind of precursor to this. By the onset of World War II, and certainly I would say by 1942, when we're looking at the imminent intervention of the United States, which is gonna change the course of the war. And we're gonna look at the development of the German initiative on the Eastern Front, which is gonna change the course of the war, all right? We have both the Axis and allied powers trying to exploit their colonial possessions for the war effort, right? And you have the fascist Italians, the Nazis, you know, talking about, not to mention the Imperial Japanese, but looking at say, the old Ottoman Empire or North Africa and saying, you know, we've got a foothold there. We could, we could expand that. And as a consequence of our efforts in this war, those would be ours. 
Because the thing about North Africa, that a lot of people forget again, I can't stress how much it's important to look at a map. What's the Mediterranean? It's a small sea between the Europe and North Africa. Yeah, is it easily navigable? It's bigger than most people think, but it's not but it's, hard to get You know across. what it isn't usually? It isn't usually very rough. No, I, and I the, found it. Go oh, ahead, I, was say, I, I found it really interesting that that's something I never thought of was the parallels Kennedy makes between Britain and Ireland and France and Algeria and the, the ways in which they, the ways in which they interacted. And I, I never really connected those two, but it makes total sense. Well, the thing is when you look at the Mediterranean and you, and you think about the climate, it's a very mild climate, very temperate. You have a lot of, I mean, mostly when we think of places like Algeria, we just think of desert. And in fact, there's a lot of that, but not all of it. And also there are deep water ports. There are all kinds of things that are useful for an expanding aspirational power, okay? Um, but that everything that's useful to the aspirational colonizer can come to be seen as value for the colonized or for other aspirants to power who are saying, I'm willing to fight you a war over that, okay? So part of what Kennedy is saying is that the subtext of the Second World War is that kind of Leninist notion of a great imperial struggle driven by capitalism, okay? You know, never mind that Russia is technically, you know, communist. They're still stuck in this global capitalist world, okay? That is the ascendant model. But also, there's the idea of the ability to project force into different continents by using uh, as way stations, these colonial possessions, okay? So part of what's happening here embedded in what, what Paul's talking about is, first of all, these um, territories are so valuable by now to the empire. They're so integrated into the economy of the empire that they're not easily disposed of. They're worth fighting for. The very fact that they're worth fighting for means other people think they're worth fighting for too. Okay, but the third component of that is they're worth taking back for a lot of people. Okay, if you then, as the colonial power, come in and you say to the to the colonized, "Oh, by the way, not only are you not getting this back, but we want you to put on uniforms and fight for us. We want you to go into harm's way," and and you're going to do that, like we're going to take people from say Nigeria. Right, but we're gonna take you to Burma or something like that. Because, because you know, we can use you, it's great. In order to do that, because you had, say using Nigeria as an example, you had the warrant chief model and a variation of indirect rule, you gotta do some negotiating. You gotta convince them that there's some something for them at the end of this. And what we've seen in, in some of these cases is the French tried this a few times, the Brits to some extent say with India. If you do this, India, if you mobilize, you know, and, and, and let us conscript a military from here, when this is all done, we're going to give you sovereignty. Never mind how. Well, all right, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. But we need you to come and help us fight in the Pacific. And suddenly then, say, nascent independence movements in India are thinking, We've got leverage. We can use the dislocations and imperatives with this condition of global war to our advantage. A, by either backing one colonial power over another and riding that tiger until it stumbles and then maybe jumping to the other colonial power, which some people did. Or in the meantime, because we're being either conscripted or otherwise mobilized militarily, we're being trained in how to fight. We're being trained in logistics. We're being trained in combat. The thing about combat training, I mean, never having been trained in combat, but I, I think about like boxing and stuff like that. You kind of don't forget that stuff. You don't, it kind of stays with you. It's once you teach somebody to do that, you know, um, it's like, huh, if, I, if somebody threatens me, I can pop them, you know? Well, if you start thinking of an insurgency like that, 
Maybe it's in the late stages of the war. Maybe until the war ends, you don't have a chance to think like that because you know, you're having this dislocation of your population where some of your young men are being conscripted. Some of them are used for infrastructure. Some of them are put in combat. You know, like what was it? Uh, Barack Obama's grandfather was a cook for the British, you know, but it, it links you to the colonial administration. It can make you a loyalist. It can also encourage in you aspirations. You know, they gave me responsibility. They kind of treated me as something other than an obstacle to them exploiting this territory. You know, I wasn't an equal with them, but they gave me responsibilities. They gave me things to do. They gave me training. And when I came back, I might have an elevated sense of what I now expect prior to the war. So embedded in what Paul's saying, all those things are, are implied. And this is what Kennedy's trying to explain to us. Again, using the term that I've used here, the war created opportunity structures for decolonization. I, I would say that that's what Kennedy's trying to teach us. And again, I, I keep leaning on that opportunity structures thing. I do that because it, it reminds me of what I'm looking for. Things that the, the colonized could recognize and exploit to their advantage. And it, it reinforces the idea, Reinhardt talked about this, um, you know, uh, Howe talked about it, we're, you know, Kennedy as well. We're not just talking about passive colonized peoples who were terrified and just, oh, I guess we can't possibly resist. There was constant resistance. Okay, this is one of the reasons for indirect rule. If you can make it appear as though the burden of governance is theirs, that you know Nigerians are governing governing Nigerians, or that you know whatever it is, and you don't always see white colonial authorities going and beating people and stuff, you know it'll be easier to maintain that. It'll be less expensive. It will also be more resilient because it will appear more like indigenous rule. It will have perhaps the illusion of a kind of semi-sovereignty. Okay. And it will also satisfy the aspirational elite who are already there. You're giving them something maybe they didn't have. Because not only are you saying you are now, hey, Bill, you're a warrant chief. Not only that, you have the entire British Empire behind you if anything goes south. Sounds good to me. I'll do that. Okay. So this idea of the Second World War is it's this, you know, it's dislocating, it's disruptive, uh, you know, it's violent. And yet, in the midst of all that, it's like in chaos, there is opportunity. If you are aware of it, if you can see it, and if you want it. Okay. Now, what else? Are there any other specific things that occurred to you in, in chapter two where you thought, you know, I didn't know this, or this might be relevant to my case, or something like that. Okay, let me just try something here. And, and again, I'm not pissed off, but I, I need an honest answer. How many of you really did not read all of chapter two? Didn't do it. Be honest with me. So you all read all of chapter two. Okay. Th then I'm curious as to why I'm not hearing anything. Because I'm going to suggest that um, Kennedy is easy to understand. He's, he's, he's not, again, he's not loading you down with vernacular. He puts together a pretty compelling narrative. But what, all I'm asking you is what's he trying to teach us? What does he want us to know that we might not know? Oh, well, I think that just in the kind of what we were talking about, about just leaning into um, the, the chaos and disruption that these big global wars were creating, it does push back at that narrative that just all of a sudden these empires didn't really want to exist anymore and just got rid of their colonies. Whereas it was just, you can even kind of see the struggle amongst themselves to be like, oh shit, we're going to start losing a lot of this stuff. And how do we hold on to that? Okay. One of the things that I mentioned last time before we went into chapter two was um, Kennedy's arguing that the second world war 
I think what he's suggesting is it made it clear that violence was going to be necessary for everyone. There was the, every colonized people realized this is a titanic, sustained, brutal, violent struggle. And that's what it takes to unseat these imperial powers. So that what Kennedy is kind of trying to argue is for those who were paying attention, which would be these aspirational elites among the colonized, more and more of them became convinced that at some point, this might well require violence. So not only did you, and this is sort of what Paul is pointing out, you had people who were conscripted, meaning they're trained in violence or the maintenance of violence, the care and feeding of violence by being support, whatever it was, you're imposing military discipline. Um, you know, you're putting people in harm's way. They have, they, they may be put into combat, whether they were intended to be or not. You're doing that, okay, but also, you're kind of inculcating this ethos of violence. This is kind of what Fanon's talking about in Algeria, but what I'm suggesting is it may not really be that peculiar to Algeria, even though when we think of Algeria, we think of violence and there's no doubt. Um, one of the things I would, I would say that he's showing us, whether he means to or not, the French as colonizers were extraordinarily brutal. I think that's important. I mean, how many of you kind of noticed that? It was like every time he'd mention the French, it would be like there'd be an atrocity or something. Um, I mean, Vietnam was one prolonged atrocity, culminating in a terrible famine. That it was partly re the responsibility of the Japanese, but only because they were working in consolidation with the Vichy French. Okay. Yeah, Brett. How, and this might just be because we live in America but it seems that Vietnam has become a, an American problem, a creation, when in fact, it seems that it was the French who created that issue. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could just as well say that it was the Chinese if you wanna go back several hundred years, but it, it's kind of like Afghanistan in the sense that it, was, it is a historically contested territory. If you look at a map, you can see why. Oh, wait a minute. God, is that Kyle coming in late? He might have had another class. Um, yeah, it's not America's creation, but America jumped in with both feet, you know, certainly after 1964-5, you know, as soon as we established that large base at Danang, it becomes an American problem, where before it was America intervening largely on behalf of the French. And to some extent, we have to be fair, on behalf of South Vietnam. Remember that um, after the Second World War, uh, one of the things that, that came out of the, the negotiations within the United Nations and among a, a number of, of diplomats was all we need to do is ensure a free and fair referendum on whether or not the people of Vietnam do or do not want to unify North and South into a single country. Okay, There really was only one major power that opposed that, and it was the United States. It was really arguably at that point that we kind of began to take that on as a burden. Now, part of that was because of de Gaulle and, and, and France and that Republic deciding we want that back and having to appeal to us and say, can you help us keep it? And us sort of saying, yes, particularly under Eisenhower saying, yeah, sure, we can do that. But you still hear Kennedy in 61 and 62 saying, yeah, you know, we, we have to do this because, you know, talking about the domino theory and all that stuff, um, well, you know, Paul refers to it as a proxy war. Um, from the United States point of view, yes, but from the French point of view, no, it ain't a proxy. They're fighting for what they believe to be their territory. This is one of the things that's hard to understand about the colonizer, right, is as far as they're concerned, this is theirs, right? No, I understand, Paul, that you were. I, I'm, I'm building on what you're saying. I, I'm not at all contesting what you're saying. Yes, from the American point of view, absolutely, it's a proxy war. Um, it's an ideological struggle because on the other side of that, in a very ambivalent kind of unity are the Soviet Union and Communist China, right? No, so yeah, I'm sorry, Paul, if I appear to be stepping on that point. I'm, I'm really not. You made a great point. But 
when, when Brett asks, you know, to what extent is this an American creation or an American problem? I think there's something to that. In other words, when America intervenes in the way that it did to separate those, two, to, to reinforce the separation of those two territories, to some extent, Vietnam is then different than it was before the American intervention. So there is a, it's a great point. And in fact, with respect to some of these other interventions that you're talking about, you might ask the same question, you know? And again, I'm thinking of, well, when the Soviets came in to what was functionally a kind of military occupation of Afghanistan, did they remake Afghanistan to some significant degree? Because, you know, first of all, did the Soviet Union actually directly govern Afghanistan? No, they had a they had a puppet government. But was it a government that was beholden to the Soviet Union for its survival? I think you can make the case that it was. In the same way that if you look at the Mujahideen, you can very easily ask yourself, would they ever have prevailed? without the support of the United States, and particularly the, the delivery of Stinger missiles and logistical support and training bases set up you know, by the CIA or through uh, Pakistani intelligence, the ISI, okay? We change the contours of the history and power structure of Afghanistan by supporting the Mujahideen in the way that we did. The Soviet Union did the same thing by supporting this sort of, you know, puppet government of, you know, contesting aspirationals within Afghanistan. What a lot of people forget about the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, and again, think about this in colonialist terms. What outraged a lot of the people of Afghanistan was not just the prospect of sort of alien or alien rule. It was that it was a progressive alien rule that the Soviets were advocating more rights for women and a liberalization of the culture and, and a lot of essentially progressive ideas. And we, we don't, when we think of the Soviet Union, we think of like clunky tanks with no reverse gear and you know cardboard clothing and all this goofy Soviet stuff. But compared to what the prevailing ethos was in Afghanistan at that time, the Soviet Union was actually trying to drag Afghanistan into the 20th century out of the 16th or the 6th in many cases, you know, it really was. Now, should they have done that? I'm not interested in that. The fact is they tried to. Did they do it because they were wonderful, nice people? Oddly enough, yeah, some of them. Some of them really believed they were doing sort of God's work or Lenin's work or whatever it was, that they were liberating oppressed peoples. Some of the Soviets really believed that. Probably not many were in the military, but on the political side, yeah, there were people in the Soviet Union who believed we are we are liberating benighted people. We are going to bring them progress in all of its benefits, just like the United States would do. For every cynic and every, you know, every brutal, you know, would-be dictator that was determining American foreign policy, there were always idealists who believed that what we were doing was saving people from themselves. Okay, you see, this is much richer and more complex. The same thing is the case in, in Vietnam. There were a lot of people in Vietnam who thought, look, this was a wretched pre-industrial place with a short lifespan and all this terrible stuff. We're trying to bring the benefits of modernity to them. Okay, and to some extent you can say, yeah, they did. Saigon, you know, before World War II was a beautiful city. It was an absolute gem. Okay, that was not a creation of Vietnam. That was a creation of French colonialism. But we know that the French created that with the blood of Vietnam. It was an incredibly brutal colonial occupation. So there's always all of these, these points of contestation. Getting back to Brett's question though, did that happen when America intervened? Did it then become sort of, oh, this is now Vietnam through the eyes of America. Yeah, for much of the world and particularly for us in America, of course it did. Vast imperial power projecting its force into this little tiny peninsula. You know, where a lot of it was even more shocking was not in Vietnam itself necessarily, but where no one looks, Laos. Laos was butchered and brutalized by this war. 
And they were not totally emancipated until 1975 because they aligned themselves with North Vietnam and the struggle to unify um, Vietnam. So they were, they were used as surrogates by the Americans in the same way that many of them had been used as surrogates by um, you know, the French colonial occupiers. Every colonial empire that projects force into these colonized areas remakes that area into something other than what it once was. And I think that was the, the question that, that Brett was getting at. And it's a great question. It's a question you all need to think about. It's why I want you to be sure really clearly to identify who was the colonizer. What was the impact of that colonialism? You know, what did they bring? What did they take? At what cost did they transform that territory? And perhaps even with what benefit? Uh, you know, one of the things to think about, and, and again, Kennedy mentions this, but he doesn't go deep into it because this is a short book. One of the legacies of colonialism for a lot of newly independent countries emerging from colonial empires beginning in the 50s and carrying all the way through the mid 1970s, they were introduced to fundamentally Western notions of human rights, sovereignty, territorial integrity, you know, decency, liberalism and with a small L meaning, you know, freedom for the individualism, all these things that had been alien to their cultures and their history, okay? Now you can sit there if you want to and you can fold your arms and say, well, that's terrible because these beautiful cultures were destroyed by imperialism. I'm not sure that's a very objective way to look at things because any number of the leaders of anti-colonial struggles referred again and again and again and again, aspirationally to the United States. Not to what it was doing as, a, as an imperial power, but to the principles on which it was founded. The whole practice of celebrating Independence Day like that, many of the, the, the framers of these post-colonial environments would say their model for that was the United States. Okay, that's a consequence and a legacy of colonialism. Those, those ideas were alien to those parts of the world. They didn't exist there, okay? When you read about Ho Chi Minh, when he's making an appeal right at the end of the Second World War for independence, he's got this thing that reads like the Declaration of Independence combined with the US Constitution. And he's saying, this is what we're gonna look like, a liberal republic. Now again, was he a, was he a I, I suppose to some extent a Marxist-Leninist? Yeah. Yeah, he was. Well, there are Marxist Leninists in Italy at this time. Where do you think these guys learned their Marxism Leninism? They didn't learn it in Vietnam and Laos. They learned it in Paris and Rome. Okay. And so, you know, I mean, we we can say, well, gee, they might go communist. That was the impetus to post war American Empire, anti-communism. Okay. But it's not accurate to say that even the most radical among them wanted grim, brutal, totalitarian dictatorships on the lines of the Soviet Union. That's just simply not accurate. Remember that many of these people had studied in the Soviet Union, but as is the case of many people who've been in the Soviet Union during Soviet communism, they never really got a very clear look at where they were because they were always being, they always had a minder with them and they were always shown the things that people wanted them to see you know where you'd find that again? Cambodia, Kampuchea, under Pol Pot. People would hear these horrific stories about human rights violations and butchery and cannibalism and terrible things. And they think, my God. And so, well, let's send a fact-finding mission. They'd be met at the airport by minders. They'd be shown what was left of Phnom Penh, the, the nice parts of it. They'd be taken to very structured public events. And people would say, well, it was a little dismal. It was very collectivist and everything else. But I didn't see any torture. I didn't see any brutality. Meanwhile, they're exterminating their own people. And the whole country is a killing fields. OK, that's the extreme of this. But that's not what people like, like Ho had in mind. And, and again, you know, they've all got failings. That's not the point. It's not about morality. But following on what Brett was saying, this is how a great power can distort that. 
in this case, the United States by saying, if it's communist, it's bad. If it's even connected with communists, it's bad. But wait a minute, sir, wasn't Ho and the early Viet Minh, weren't they fighting on behalf of the allies? Weren't they fighting the Japanese, the Axis powers? I don't care. That was then and this is now. That's about what those conversations were like. Ho Chi Minh had been our ally because we had a common enemy, the Imperial Japanese. Everyone seems to forget that. So these histories are always richer. But as soon as the United States muscles in, being the big power that we are, yeah, that country's never the same. Never the same. Okay? So this is what I want you to think about with chapter two, um, is the whole legacy of the war. That idea of, wow, there was all this chaos. There, was, there, were, there were these, you know, this mobilization. There were famines, and yet some of the countries were untouched by it. Um, there were these dislocations, but in the midst of all of that, there were these incipient opportunities for people to exploit this titanic struggle between these empires and look beyond that to a point where, you know what, we could come out the other end of this and be what we want to be instead of what they want us to be. This is what Kennedy's trying to say, I think, in chapter two, okay? I feel like I've just about burned you out. Is that accurate? It's a lot to cover. I totally get that. But that's what I want you to think about. Um, maybe take another look at chapter two. So what I'd like you to do for Wednesday is, and we might have a fairly short class on Wednesday, um, if in fact, um, I'm trying to remember, I'm sorry, I can't remember where chapter three begins. Um, let me look just so I can make sure. Yeah, on page 46. Okay, so if you could have chapter three beginning on page 46, have that read by Wednesday. So that I don't have to talk quite as much. You mean and I could Thursday. I'm sorry, by Thursday. Yeah, I was just looking at my calendar here and looked at the wrong. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, by Thursday. So that um, you can tell me what's in chapter three. Okay, and in the meantime, if anybody um, has questions about their proposal or anything like that, where you feel like it would be useful to talk to me, just shoot me an email. Um, and if we can't resolve it via email and you want to have a Zoom meeting, that's cool. We can do that too. Anything else? It's yeah. I got to ask you though. I mean, because I'm a little concerned. Is this making any sense at all, or is it, or is it still like ah, I'm totally confused? It should just about be starting to kick in right now because we're halfway through the term. So if it's just now starting to kick in, then we're right about where we should be. Okay, good. All right, then I'll hopefully uh, see you all here on um, Thursday. And it seems to me, I don't, I don't remember, was, Pamela, was that you? Did you want to talk to me after class? All right, so as soon as everybody else busts out of here, um, we can talk, I think might be the easiest thing to do. I'm going to stop recording though.